morning and welcome to the webinar series using location analytics to analyze demographic population and consumer trends for commercial real estate. On behalf of myself, Leah Christman, Vice President, Linda Christman, owner of the Mid-Atlantic Real Estate Journal, and Ronald Shapiro, producer of today's event, we would like to thank you all for joining us this morning. As you know, the Mid-Atlantic Real Estate Journal is a commercial real estate trade, print, and digital publication. We have a readership of over 25,000 industry professionals throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. We would like to thank our program sponsor for today, Placer AI. If you find this program interesting and would like to get your company involved in a future webinar, please reach out to myself or Ronald for more information. Ronald Shapiro is our moderator for today's program. Ronald is a retired assistant professor at Rutgers Business School. He taught real estate, finance, investment, and financial management courses on the Newark and New Brunswick campuses. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please send them directly to Ronald. Please welcome Ronald and his amazing speakers. Thank you, Leah. Good morning, everyone. This morning, we are pleased to present Ethan Chernovsky and Ben Witten of Placer AI. Our two speakers have put together a very informative presentation on using location analytics to analyze demographic population and consumer trends in commercial real estate. I'd like to thank the speakers and their company for their sponsorship and their participation in today's webinar. We encourage questions from the audience. Please submit them using the chat tab on your screen we will try to get to as many questions as time permits. And I will now hand the presentation over to Ethan. Ethan. Thank you so much, Ron. And thank you everyone for being here. We're really excited to be doing this today. Uh, before we get started, we wanted to give you kind of a quick introduction to the data that's gonna be informing a lot of the perspectives that we, we bring to the table. So, you know, what is Placer? Placer is a location data company. What does that mean? People vote with their feet. We show you how they vote across the United States every single day. We do that by observing a panel of tens of millions of devices. Very critically, it's all aggregate de-identified data. So we are GDPR and CCPA compliant. We then analyze that data with machine learning and AI algorithms in order to make estimations on visits to retail locations across the country. And we present that data in a wealth of different reports within our platform on everything from demographics, true trade areas, visit trends, visit frequency, void analysis, and a whole lot more. Uh, and with that, I think we can uh, dive in. Ethan, what was the biggest takeaway for you from the holiday retail season? So for me, when I look back at the holiday season, the, the most interesting thing for me was the stages of it, right? So when we look at the data, we see that there were these different peaks for different periods that impacted different retailers differently. And that tells us a couple of really important things. So for example, we saw that there was the early shopping season. We saw that there was kind of that Black Friday surge. We saw that pre-Christmas kind of pickup. And then we saw that, that bump in visits in the immediate post-Christmas aftermath. But what's interesting is when you break down each of those stages, there's like a different consumer mindset for each one. So that October, early November period, it's guided by a consumer that is looking to get ahead of things, wants to get that list checked off, is oriented towards finding the ideal product or kind of assuaging their own anxiety and making sure their list is covered. Whereas like kind of the Black Friday visitor is much more about kind of the, the hustle and bustle of these big days. That post-Christmas period is much more oriented towards gift cards, returns, and even that pre-Christmas period, it's about kind of, uh-oh, there's things that I need to get that I, I wasn't thinking of. And that understanding is so important from a retail perspective and a retail real estate perspective because it tells us so much about the consumer that's visiting and the type of experiences we want to provide and the way that we can engage them differently throughout those periods in order to provide this maximal, this maximized experience for the consumer that will ultimately drive the maximum amount of transactions. Ben, I, what did you see? Yeah, I would definitely echo all of that. And I think what to, to me, what's especially interesting, there's two things, you know, one, this holiday season had the benefit of that additional Saturday. And so consumers like myself, maybe they're a little more inclined to procrastinate when it comes to, to shopping and the like, uh, you know, had an extra uh, extra weekend to fulfill those needs. And so you definitely see that lift off in that last Saturday right before Christmas. 
What I think is also interesting here is, you know, there's a lot of pundits and you hear a lot of opinions about, you know, the department store and the, the death of the mall and this business model and this channel that's obsolete and it's not relevant to today's consumer. And I think it, not, not just, I, I don't just think it, but the data clearly shows like this is uh, clearly not the case. The department store is as relevant as ever. And you see this separation and visitation where the department stores really do shine, uh, especially in those those latter weeks of the year right before the holiday, where they're they're very relevant, and consumers do gravitate, uh, to, you know, to that model. Mixed use has has become a bigger bigger use uh, in the recent years. What does mixed use mean for professionals looking to maximize the impact of brick and mortar locations? Yeah, happy to dive in on that one. So, you know, a little bit about my background. I, I was a trademark property company prior to joining Placer, and we were tasked with developing and redeveloping mixed-use town, town centers, lifestyle centers, and, and malls. And, you know, what we continue to see and continue to find is that, you know, really there's a premium for every component of mixed-use, meaning that office that's in a mixed-use environment that's walkable to amenities and restaurants and fitness and apartments that are walkable to a grocery store right, all achieve a rent premium. And so ultimately what that means, you know, for owners and investors is that they're able to achieve, you know, outsized returns for those mixed use opportunities that are that are really well executed. Yeah, I also think it's important to note that kind of when we think about mixed use, there's, there's all of these different applications to the concept, but I do think that it raises the level of complexity for what we're looking at. So if we think about kind of a shopping center, even that you know, has a co-working space within it or a kind of a health-oriented med tail retailer there. It, the, these newer concepts, so to speak, they they bring a, a, another layer of thinking that needs to go into the mix. And it's it increases the level of opportunity that's available to kind of retailers to find their ideal mix, shopping center owners to create this, this kind of perfect kind of tenancy mix. But it also creates a lot of complexity. So that need to understand and to look at examples elsewhere it's absolutely heightened, and there is a growing understanding that though there is more opportunity, and that opportunity is a very good thing, we need to be thinking about the levels of complexity that are being added to the mix in order to maximize these opportunities. The office recovery has been a hot topic of conversation these last couple of years. Where do you think the recovery stands today, and where do you expect it to land in the future? I think we're a beat away from seeing it hit its, at least it's for the next few years, it's kind of stable point. So I, I the, la the latest data we were looking at so showed our nationwide index at around 39% 39, 39 down on what it was pre-pandemic. Now, obviously there's New York is outperforming while San Francisco is lagging more behind. But when when we look at it, we're seeing a couple of things that look steady. So one, midweek as opposed to the Monday, Friday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, seeing the bulk of, of visits. And then two, the audiences that are coming back, more often the audience that are coming back less. And this is why we think it's it's a steady trend. When we look at, at true trade areas that are more oriented towards people with families, the recovery is less from those areas. Whereas if you are single and less likely to have a family or less likely to have kids, you're more likely to be returning to the office more often, which is exactly kind of who needs the flexibility and which is, gives us this indication that this three, maybe three and a half-ish days a week area is where we're going to see, see things land at least over the longer short term, let's call it the next year or two. Yeah, and I think, I think to elaborate on everything Ethan said, you know, there's, there's certainly a lot of nuance, right? There's definitely a broad kind of brush, you know, national observation of, of where ops, office utilization is. But, you know, as you said, right, there's, there's a big difference between, you know, how New York versus San Francisco are performing. And even within those markets, different sub markets are performing very differently than one another. And generally, you know, the data continues to corroborate the, the theme of flight to quality, where you're seeing the absorption and utilization, you know, improving in these trophy assets that are well amenitized, that are walkable, that are newer builds, right? Like have great F and B programming, et cetera. Whereas you're seeing, you know, some of the uh, momentum shift away from the, you know, maybe B and, and, and older buildings that have not been updated 
and don't have those same amenities. And so uh, you continue to see the the investors that you know are positioning and allocating dollars to amenities uh, to continue to see that definitely uh, yield results in terms of desirability and also just where the, the leasing momentum is happening, right? Where it really is gravitating to those buildings that are, are more well amenitized and walkable. Of the various segments that we have in our industry, which which segment do you believe uh, is going to be the most approved and kind of which excites you the most? Ethan, go for it. Uh, so for me, it's like I, I go with the kind of afford this wider affordable luxury category. So I think coffee fits there. I think theaters would fit there if there wasn't for some kind of, you know, headwinds that they're going to face. Uh, self-care fits within this category, but elements where people can, you know, we, we are in this period of wider kind of an extended economic uncertainty and uncertainty is kind of the key term here because it's not all bad, but it's, we don't really know when things are going to get better. And as a result, that, that plays on kind of consumer spend and, and consumer thinking. And so I think even when we look at, you know, kind of the holidays and what people spent on, it was less spending on like big ticket items. So like home furnishings saw a big drop because that's kind of something you can delay. So I think this idea of areas where, you know, all right, I'm going to splurge on that coffee for six bucks instead of making it on home. But at the same time, I'm going to be, you know, maybe delaying that new couch that I really want to get. I think anyone who fits within that category is likely to see a positive scenario in the short term. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think there's definitely, you know, the consumer mindset of, you know, treating yourself or, you know, I, I've earned this or I deserve this and and that kind of a mentality as it relates to, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, health and beauty, right? We, we've seen like outstanding comps for, you know, Ulta and Sephora. And it's also, uh, you know, like the nail salons and, and uses like that, but it's also, to your point, Ethan, like the the coffee and the donuts and and all of that, uh, where we've seen, you know, like Dutch Brothers and Seven Brew and and the like, just on a tear and continue to perform, you know, quite well. And certainly, there's also this kind of like dichotomy. It's it's kind of two sides of the same coin of return to office and everything else. As we see folks like out of home more and they're in the office more, they're in a third place, whether that's co working or wherever it might be, that they're more likely to make those stops into, uh, you know, one of these establishments either on their way into that third place or on their way home. Let me ask a related question on that prior slide. As our population ages, do you see a bigger trend down the road to have developers uh, produce more, let's say, age in place housing or affordable housing or retail uh, components that might cater to this increased aging population? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm in I'm in Fort Worth, Texas. We have you know Simon Properties and Casco have a you know massive mixed use master plan development here where you've got you know Neiman's, AMC, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, etc., and a great you know food and beverage program, great entertainment, all of that. What's interesting is there's now three phases of residential that have been built, and the third phase called the tradition is exactly what you just said, Ronald. So it's a it's a it's a you know very high end uh, senior housing project that's right on the Trinity River, right on the trail. It's very walkable, and I think to your point, you know, as as folks are are aging and but also looking to remain active, right? They want to maintain access to all those amenities and the lifestyle, et cetera. Hundred uh, percent see that you know senior housing definitely has a place, uh, whether it's active adult or across the spectrum, definitely has a place in those those mixed use environments. How has the consumer changed and what do you expect from consumer behavior in 2024? I, I think there's two, I mean, there's a handful of big things, right? So let's actually create three buckets. I think the consumer is very often in a different place. And we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but there was, again, let's, let's put this in, in context. There was a lot of movement, but a lot of movement when we think about from a migration perspective is actually a small audience, but very often a significant audience for retail. But there was a lot, there was a lot of movement in the last few years, likely with paces picked up because of the pandemic. This idea of flexibility is really significant. Again, it's not everybody, but 
the idea that I don't have to be in the office every day or I can be a little bit, I can think a little bit differently about my hours really changes my retail patterns. I mean, the idea that I can go to the grocery store at 8 a.m. on a Monday morning and do it more leisurely and look at my list and not feel as pressured. And it's not 6.30 p.m. on Tuesday after a long day at the office. And I'm like, get me out of here. I'm just going to order from McDonald's. It's a very big impact. And the last bit is, again, I, the extended period of uncertainty. The idea that not everything is terrible, not the sky is falling, but I don't really feel confident the situation is going to get dramatically better in the very near term. I think that all plays into the consumer. And so when we think about things like uh, budget-oriented groceries, so whether it's the Aldi's of the world, grocery market on the West Coast, uh, grocery outlet on the West Coast, there's some really big opportunities for them to grab visit share and potentially keep a lot of it even as things swing back. When we think about the flexibility, there's real benefits to retailers and, and restaurant groups that can lean into that. So think about that, you know, you're working from home on a Wednesday and you just got to get out of the house for a little bit. So you pop over to the local cafe in the afternoon. There's an opportunity that comes along with that. And if I'm the restaurant owner, I'm doing my best to incentivize that because that's not peak hours for a suburban cafe. And those steps forward to maximize those shifts and understand those shifts, within that lies a tremendous amount of retail and dining opportunity. You know, if those cafe owners would only decrease their prices by 10%, they get a lot more uh, foot traffic. That's a, that's a, that's a non-scripted comment. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah, it's interesting just looking at like the share of weekend visits. It's what surprised me here is that if you look at, you know, the latter part of 23, that share of weekend visits is actually above where it was pre-COVID. And so in some ways, you know, we're, we are very much creatures of habit, you know, human beings. And so there's kind of this rubber band elasticity effect back to kind of the way things were. And I think we definitely have seen that bounce back uh you know, too. I, I am one, you know, working from home, I, I'm definitely one of those that you might see at Trader Joe's on a Tuesday or Wednesday, middle of the day, you know, there, no one else is there. Uh, it's great, right? The store's fully stocked. It's not, there's no lines. Uh, so I think there's definitely benefits, you know, to uh, having some of that flexibility. And I think the consumer appreciates that that flexibility as well. But I, I do agree, like there's, there has to be the right incentive or, or messaging or even just like reminder of like, oh yeah, that's, this is a good time to, to do that. I don't need to wait till Saturday or Sunday. I can actually, you know, uh, make some of these, these stops, you know, midday. And so uh, I think that the clever, you know, retailers are, are definitely kind of onto that, thinking about ways to kind of promote that messaging. The dining sector has been a big topic of conversation uh, post COVID. I'm wondering whether you guys see a, a change in this sector over time, particularly later this year. Yeah, I think the 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 whole you know uh, health and wellness category, whether that relates to fitness or relates to dining, I think everybody is thinking about how can I improve you know longevity, uh, well being, especially like you know cold and flu season. There's really just this kind of mindset of how can I you know just promote wellness, and so a big part of that is the you know sweet green and crisp and green and you know Mendocino Farms. I mean, all the groups in this category, I think, cater to that audience. And so as you're seeing, you know, a, a more and more of an abundance of fast casual options that are, you know, healthier and farm to table and promote, you know, all of these sorts of things. I think, the, you know, the, the consumer clearly uh, favors and, and is gravitating to those those options. We have our first question from the audience. Let me read you uh, it uh, verbatim. Bruce is asking at the beginning of the presentation. You talked about visitation to various retail establishments. How does this compare to the shift to online shopping? Is there a trend toward a need for fewer brick and mortar establishments, regardless of your trend evaluation? So I think there's there's two important questions packed in there, and like to to kind of to unpack this question. So one is. Um, it depends on the type of, of retailer. So there are certain types of retail, and I think you know, grocery is a great example. The estimations we saw pre-pandemic were about two to four percent of grocery is, is online led, right? So that can be buy online, pick up in store, it can be delivery. That's jumped to about four to six percent 
at the height of the pandemic and probably dropped down somewhere in between the two since. Now that's a, that's a massive amount of growth for that segment, but that's still very, very physical store oriented. And even the solutions that are delivery, buy online, pick up at store still depend on the retail location. So there are some yes. segments that are just not as impacted by online. The other element is even those that are heavily impacted by online, there's a few elements here. One is what am I trying to gain out of the store? So I think the classic, the store is just about sales per square foot model is a thing of the past. It's not relevant anymore because there are so many values that retailers are getting from physical location. There's an advertising element. One of the things we see very often is we look about like digitally natives. When they come offline, they see an immediate e-commerce boost in the areas where they launch in. There's the efficiency, the optimization element. So I think it was the CEO of Everlane who said the worst kept secret in uh, in uh, online only is that it's not profitable at scale, right? <laughs> he said this to CNBC. The, this stores are a necessary part of the puzzle. In some cases, there are too many, but that's usually a retailer specific element. So there are some who are overextended. There are some who probably need more locations, but overall, I would argue that the value of the store has actually never been larger than it is today. Yeah, I would agree with that. And just to echo and, and uh, add some other you know data points, you know, if you look at you know recent reports from Cushman or JLL, you know, the uh, historically low retail vacancy is a is an ongoing trend. And there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, one, there's there's very limited you know new construction and new supply. Through the construction costs and a lot of barriers to entry there, and it's also uh, a lot of you know retailers that were pressure tested through the pandemic, coming out of the pandemic, uh, that are now you know in a strong position to expand. So there's a lot of demand on one side, and there's limited new supply on the other side. And so there's a few things happening there. One is we're seeing uh, a lot of um, repurposing of you know second generation space. You know, for example, we saw like Trader Joe's take a former Pet Boys, you know auto parts store in, in Utah. We've seen them, you know, Trader Joe's take former dollar stores and and you see a lot of recycling in the QSR space and, and the like. And so, uh, you know, to me, what that suggests is that there's always going to be strong demand for good real estate, right? So for good real estate with good traffic fundamentals and good traffic and demographic fundamentals, there's always going to be strong demand there. And so I, I would say, you know, the current conditions of the market, uh, while while some pockets may be oversupplied, generally speaking, those those desirable markets uh, are are still you know uh, significantly undersupplied, where you are seeing very very strong you know fundamentals and, and rent growth, and and don't expect that to to change anytime soon. Yeah, I mean, just to, to quadruple down on this, like you saw when Bed Bath and Beyond was closing locations, there was such intense demand immediately for those spaces because they were well positioned. There was a lot of folks who could benefit from it. I think Burlington, total wine, hundred percent. And the idea that I think the, the long tail of, of retail is growing. So the number of players who are interested in spaces is actually increasing. So you'll see declines where, you know, uh, Macy's will drop the number of locations, but all these digitally natives that want not 200, but 40 to 50 locations, ultimately all of the med tail, all of the kind of cannabis dispensaries that are now entering the mix, all of these segments that are rising to take a finite amount of spaces where you don't have a ton of building of new, I think that's actually going to lead to this, the physical spaces becoming all the more valued. And again, and this is what we, we hear from so many retailers, the expansion of the viewpoint of what we are getting from the space is so significant to why there is this kind of re-recognition of the value of physical spaces. There's been a lot of conversation about the exodus from cities. Right here in the New York, New Jersey area, we hear and we see people leaving the cities to come to the Garden State, New Jersey. Is this more talk than real? Or is this more of an exchange than an exodus that we've that we've been hearing about? And what effect has it have on the retail economy? Yeah, migration has definitely been a factor, and a lot of it has been a shift in thinking around you know life revolving around the workplace, 
to ro- life revolving around, you know, family and friends and community and the like. And so with that, there has certainly been a shift in, you know, where, where folks live, where they work, uh, where they shop, et cetera. And so as you know, the data clearly shows like there, there, there was a, a lag in some of those urban centers coming out of the pandemic. In 23, we started to see some convergence where those, you know, urban centers in blue, uh, you know, started to catch up and kind of close that gap. Uh, and so I, I think it's going to be an interesting one to continue to watch, you know, is this the new normal or, or uh, does it, does it you know, revert back to where it was? So uh, definitely an interesting theme to continue to watch. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's, I'll go more extreme than Ben. I think this is a golden opportunity on both sides of the spectrum. So if we think about, you know, the suburbs, you know, that, that couple with two kids in their late thirties that was living in New York city and that now is like, all right, I can't, we're, we're too small of a space. We got to get out of here. And now moved to New Jersey and bought that house. And now has all that fa- space to fill very often has, you know, these are, this is a lot of the movement is from places with a higher cost of living to a lower cost of living. So there is yeah. this kind of understanding there could be more disposable income than there was in the past and more space to fill that disposable income mm-hmm. with. I mean, I, it's kind of it's it's a little bit of a joke, but I mean it very seriously. Again, forget the first time demand for things like furniture, patio furniture, whatever you might need. But also think about what happens if you have this big pantry when you've left that apartment. All of a sudden, that visit to Costco to get that you know giant human sized thing of mustard makes a lot more sense because you have the space for it where you didn't in the past. But I think the reverse is also true. So. There is a lot of I mean, great data from, and I'm slipping my mind right now, but they do uh, lease data in New York City. And they had really interesting data that showed that in the midst of the pandemic, as we were talking about this exodus, it was young people coming in and signing leases. And, and that means that kind of if I'm targeting Gen Z, there's a real opportunity for me in urban environments. And that is that is super significant because I think it underpins a lot of what we're hearing in the kind of the wider retail narrative where we're hearing about you know some retailers leaving new york city or san francisco or or kind of you know boston whatever it may be that's not because they don't believe in the cities it's because their audience isn't in all of these areas the way they were before so i think the exchange narrative is much more effective and valuable and gives us a much better sense of what's truly happening than this idea of exodus We talked a little bit about the flexibility that retail shop owners need to employ to attract more foot traffic. Could you talk more about what possibilities these retail stores have in terms of creating more foot traffic and what's the future trend of this? This is is one of my favorite topics. I get very excited about it, but we look at it, it started, and um, I apologize for the for the the not so exciting history lesson. But at one point, when we had first, when we I first joined Placer, we were looking at uh, data from the South Coast Plaza, California, big mall, and we saw that visits were were way down year over year. And we were like, well, I guess this mall isn't performing that well. And we happened to be standing with someone. The person who had asked us to pull up the the location said, Oh no no no, they're doing great. Uh, you're just comparing it to the peak when Kim Kardashian had a had a pop up in the mall. And it was this unbelievably clear jump in visits in a period that didn't normally see it. And I think this idea of of the pop-up, of the experiential element that changes in a shopping center is really, really important because it creates this kind of win-win-win, right? Players that don't need to have a space all the time or who want to test out what a physical space might look like, whether, by the way, it could be because of seasonality. I'm, you know, I'm... Spirit Halloween, so I don't need it all year long. Or, you know, I want to just test out a physical space. Like, I think that was a big motivation for Sheehan. Or, you know, I am, I don't know, I'm doing something around the football season and it's ahead of the Super Bowl and I want to make sure I'm in Vegas for the whole month before, but I don't need it the rest of the year. There is something really exciting because it creates a value for those players who are getting involved. It creates a value for the shopping center owners because there's this ability to generate urgency. And it creates value from the consumer because it makes things exciting. It's a reason to get up and go make a visit to a shopping center because there's this new element. So then ultimately, the retailers that are in these centers benefit as well. 
I think the big question is just how scalable is it? So we've seen a lot of it. It's super exciting. The data suggests that more people come, they come from a wider area and it infuses a new audience into these shopping centers. The question is how hard is it? And is there enough demand for this to be an ongoing feature within the retail landscape? So Ethan, how would you define this term you have on the screen, this pop-up? What what basically is it? I think a short-term retail space. So, nice you know, hand, yeah, that, that's how that's how I would define it. I'm sure Ben has a much more refined definition, but that- No, uh, that's, that's it. It's just a short-term, you know, oftentimes experiential pop-up, right? It's like specialty leasing you would see in a mall could be it could be like an inline space. It could be a food truck, right, in the common area. But it would not be one of these kiosks that we see in the mall that are more and more populating the uh, common area as you walk through the uh, the space. Probably not the cell phone, the bedazzled cell phone cases. Uh -huh. I wouldn't classify that. One one example that you know we implemented at, at trademark. You know we had a concept in Dallas called Sweet Tooth Hotel, which is basically akin to like a museum of ice cream, like, like an Instagram selfie museum, if you will, right? And so at a couple of our properties, we had done, you know, pop-ups. We did a, a Christmas and like a winter exhibit on a short-term deal. And, and a few of these actually turned into long-term leases where there was enough traffic and enough tourism around some of these super regional assets that these actually did convert uh, to, to permanent leases. So I think that's another benefit, right? That, like you said, Ethan, like these pop-ups are a great way to test the market, see if the demand's there, and you know, structured appropriately, the tenant actually, in some cases, has the optionality to stick around, like you know, as long as we want, you know, or for six months or a year, if the demand is there and certain sales thresholds are met. So, a great way, I think, for both parties to think about just the continued adaptation of of retail spaces. But from a landlord's perspective, the landlord's not going to invest a heavy tenant improvements, capital improvements on a pop up situation. Or am I wrong about that? Typically not. I mean, I've seen it where landlord says, hey, you know, we, we have a space that's a little rough, like we'll white box it for you, where it's basically like a, you know, it's got mechanical, HVAC, lighting, you know, it looks presentable, but the rest is up to you. I, I mean, you are like, again, let, let's go to the extreme end of this. And I know things like, I think it was called brandless. It didn't really work, but there you are hearing from certain mall owners that they are they like the idea of having space available for this. And again, there's only so much you can commit. But I, I do think, especially when you consider the fact that there's less space available, especially in those top tier properties, and it's, you know, you have these long-term leases, the ability to create to bring in elements that create that buzz is really important. It's just the question of how much does it cost to invest in it? Can this be something that be built on over time because if so there's a there's a tremendous amount of value here so what is placemaking what does it mean to you and has an impact the retail markets going forward i mean to me placemaking is all about experience and and convenience right so offering a service or an amenity to a customer that they may not have expected or, you know, soft seating or art or, you know, music in the common areas. But it can also be things like, you know, EV charging are coming up more and more, not just as an amenity, but it's kind of a necessity in a lot of centers. It's there's this there's this idea. And to be fair, I, I think it was at least for me, it was it was something we were hearing more about within our civic audience. So they think about those economic development groups of how do I create an area where you want to spend as much time as possible? And that's draws to get you in, but things to keep you there longer. In the retail space, it's it's really it's it, first of all, it's, it's not something new, but the I think the level of focus on it is increasing. So we talk to we talk about kind of land, we talk with landlords about things like sitting areas and the investments they're making there, art installations like Ben mentioned. Anything that makes you say, all right, I came here to get a coffee. Maybe I'll work here for another hour. And we were talking to one mall owner who literally said, he's like, I knew we got it right with this property when we had a guest that was visiting and they went to go look at the mall and they said, we ended up spending our entire afternoon there because we just hopped down and we worked the whole afternoon. He's mm -hmm. like, that's how we knew we got it right. And I think there's that element of, you know, again, think about flexibility and, and you know, the, the growing diversity of what's going on within these spaces. 
the longer I can get you to spend there, the more opportunities you'll have. What, one of my favorite, it seems like a sillier example, but I think it's, I think it's, a, it kind of makes the point effectively. Uh, there's a mall in Dubai that has this massive aquarium in it. And most of the aquarium, though it is a paid to a pay to enter attraction, you can see most of the aquarium from outside. But what's right across from this massive aquarium? All of the restaurants and coffee places. Because if you're walking around said mall with the family of a couple of kids, yeah, this is an entertaining way to sit there and have a meal because they're not going to get bored as fast. And so these elements of can I create, obviously that's an exaggerated version of it, but there are so many ways to, to create this better experience for the visitor that will make them spend more time that will increase the likelihood that they spend more money. I see yeah, you have the term. That, oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say real quick to that point, you know, a few of the amenities that we would roll out at, you know, B malls that we were you know, repositioning and, and wanting to show quick wins and improve the, the consumer experience, you know, right out of the gate, you know, that would include like adding common area Wi-Fi, which seems crazy that that didn't already exist. But to your point, Ethan, like if somebody has some free time between work or they have their iPad or their laptop and they're going to like knock out a few emails, get a coffee, right? So Wi-Fi was a really big one. Another one was we added a concierge program that offered hands-free shopping, right? So like one of these was a three-story mall in Dallas where you could go and literally drop off your bags, you know, get a voucher, uh, a ticket, and then they would bring them to your car when you're ready to pick up at the valet, right? So having the hands-free, having Wi-Fi, like those we found were really big items to improve dwell times. And, and visit frequency. I see you have the term EV charging stations on the screen. What do you see as the future demand for these EV charging stations? Is it a good thing to have on a retail developer's property going forward, an office building property going forward? Is this an attraction? Is it a plus? Or do you think it's a minus? Oh, I think it's a huge plus. And I'll give all the credit to Mickey Papillon from uh, Irvine, who's the one who kind of turned me on to this for the first time. But one, it's all right. You need to. You have a. You have your Tesla in California, and there's there's benefits to having an EV car, and you need to charge it. And you're choosing between it. You know, I need to go. I don't know. I want to go get a coffee. One shopping center does have EV charging. The other one doesn't. That could help make the decision of where you go because you do need to charge up the car. But then there's also the idea that that charging station can be used for advertising and potentially even to boost the opportunities at the center you're in. So you're charging your car, good for you, come get a dollar off at, you know, ice cream store or whatever it may be. And you're you're layering in these incentives to visit, these incentives to stay. I think it's super exciting because it's it's not really a big, there's not really a huge space cost to something you can do to upgrade your property. Yeah, I, I would agree completely. I think it also makes more, the most sense, certainly in an office environment, but all, definitely in a residential environment where you have overnight, you have the ability to actually get a full charge, you know, over several hours uh, versus, you know, just kind of a top off or a quick, a quick charge where I might be having lunch, you know, for an hour. So we're definitely seeing, you know, uh, a, a, a lot of adoption of EV in the apartment space uh, and, and office as well. So what are your guys' uh, bold predictions for 2024? I'll, I'll kick it off. I, I think I think one is, and we've kind of mentioned it before, but I think office is going to level out at about you know seventy percent of what it was. So we're going to see it continue to improve, but that's where it's going to stop and hold. I think the the other one, and this is this is sadly not the the most positive prediction. I think we're going to see a, a rougher year in movie theaters after a really strong twenty twenty three. And what's interesting is. I, I, uh, I don't think it has anything to do, meaning there's some things that the theaters can do to do better, obviously. But I think this is less about the theaters and much more about the context. So there's a concern about, is content going to be delayed because of the writer's strike? The bar that was set last year was just so high with kind of Barbie and Taylor Swift and Oppenheimer and everything in between, that if there's any negative, it might not look as good. And so I think a segment that was really rebounding in a positive way is going to see a slightly rougher year this year. Yes, yeah, definitely. You know, from my point of view, I, I think the the strong retail fundamentals are, are likely to continue just with limited new supply. 
what's been interesting, like from a capital allocation standpoint is, you know, pre-COVID retail was about 20% of institutional capital invested in CRE. And post-COVID, it's dropped to about 10%. And so I, I would say, you know, my, my prediction, uh, provided that rates, you know, stabilize and hopefully come in a little bit, we actually see that allocation to retail move back up closer to 15%. Ben, you, you mentioned the magic word about rates. And I know this is not a, a topic, <laughs> uh, not a topic uh, of, of discussion for today, but since you hit on a, a big topic that is of a, a lot of interest, uh, certainly uh, to the people on the call, what are your thoughts, even though this is a, a non-scripted question, what are, you, what are your thoughts about where rates are going to be uh, in June, uh, July, uh, toward the end of the year? If I said I knew or had any idea, I would be lying. So uh, <laughs> for what it's worth. But it feels like we're, we're probably at least in a, a steady environment and perhaps they, they come in a little bit. But, you know, who, who knows? Time will tell. Ethan, any thoughts on rates? I'm, I'm going to go with Ben. If Ben says time will tell, I'm going to wait on I'm going to wait on time as well. All right. Well, I'm asking. I'm looking to see if there's any questions from the. What do audience. you think, Ron? I I think we are going to see a couple of different rate decreases, and I didn't spoke. I didn't speak to Jerome Powell this morning, so uh, this is strictly uh, you know my, <laughs> my prediction. I think we'll start to see some rate decreases. I kind of thought we might have our first one in March, but apparently you know that's going to happen. And I think the the overall market is looking for some some direction, looking for some indication, because rate movements has, a, as you know, a large impact, a large impact on the overall real estate uh, market and the economy. And, uh, you know, we, we it wasn't that long ago where we saw rates six, seven percent. Uh, you know, I talked to a lot of, you know, mortgage brokers, you know, uh, mm -hmm. around here and, uh, you know, their, their business, their business has pretty much shut down Lenders have stopped lending, uh, you know, post-COVID uh, for the most part, because they just, if they're trying to hold quality, you know, credit quality, they just don't see a huge demand. Yeah. However, we also see, and this is obviously away from the topic of conversation, but uh, now that I'm thinking about it, we're hearing about a flood of, you know, distress assets coming on the market and a reduction in rates could help you know, solidify and stabilize this market. But uh, obviously it has nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but uh, just you asked me, so I thought I'd give you <laughs> my, my comments on that. No, interesting perspectives for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, there is a lot of talk of the flood of maturities and gloom and doom and CRE. And I, I think, again, the media tends to paint with kind of a broad brush, you know, narrative. There's, there's kind of two buckets, you know, one obviously being office, which has massively been disrupted. I don't know if rates are going to help office. The other is, you know, multifamily, right? Where most multifamily, you know, development construction loans are floating rate short term, right? Those, those loans come due and you've got to refi at higher rates. All of a sudden, a project that was highly profitable is now, you know, break even or underwater. So, you know, rates could certainly help in that department. And so we hope that they do, right? That that uh, frees up some liquidity and that, you know, the housing, the housing shortage can can continue to be chipped away at with with new inventory. Guys, if our audience after today's presentation uh, wants to uh, you know um, reach out to you, uh, ask you any particular questions, either with respect to any of the material on the slide or anything that might be related, how, how what's the best procedure for them to do that? So you can first of all, if you want to learn more, there's there's a free version of our of our premium product available at placer.ai. You can always reach out to us. I'm at Ethan E T H A N at placer.ai, and Ben is at Ben B E N dot Witten W I T T T T E N at placer.ai.